on on Skype. We are go. This is we are go for a podcast, Pete. It is. Let's see. Wait. It is Saturday, the third of December, twenty twenty-two. And what 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 number is this, Pete? Two four two number two forty-two and. Crank it in, Robert, and crank it in, Ralph, and crank it in, Charlie. Crank it in, Charlie. All you guys have got to crank it in. Crank it in because we're we're very happy. Pete, I'm going to turn down my volume here a little bit because sometimes I get some bleed through. I don't want to turn it down so far I can't hear you, but I'm going to turn it down. I know you're, you you got the very sophisticated earbuds, headphones, and that's pretty cool. Actually, I just bought these, and and you can shut the mic off. Oh, okay. So so I shut the mic off on the earbuds and I use the, the standard microphone. And and I gotta tell you, the nicest part about the earbuds, it's got an eight foot cord. <laughs> My so, I know these old <laughs> headphones that I'm using have a shorter cord. Yeah. He, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. Well, we might as well talk about that now. This is in the travelogue portion. Speaking about earbuds and ear pods, I have moved into the world of hearing aids. Yes. Right? Well, mostly because the Veterans Administration will give them to me for free. So I went out and made a couple of trips out to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and got them. I have some high-frequency hearing loss. Most of the time, I'm okay, but at high frequencies, it uh, I can't hear too well. And this has become an issue as we've built a direct conversion receiver because oh, people yeah. will be complaining about hiss. And I'm like, what are you what talking is? about? It sounds great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because, what is? I, because I've got this kind of filter in my damaged ears, yeah. right? So anyway, I went out to Fort Belvoir and they gave me these really high speed, high tech hearing aids. They're great. But, you know, here I, I, I'm not, I don't know whether I'm going to use them all the time. I, I, I don't know. They're kind of uncomfortable. You got to put them in the ear canal and all that. And not only that, most of the time I'm okay. I mean, I've been okay with my hearing this way. For the last 40 years or so right so i got used to it now when i put them in things sound a little bit better but it's kind of a marginal benefit so i don't know uh, i i might i have them on call if i need them but here's the other thing pete that i heard about you mentioned your earbuds the technology has moved forward so fast so far that the the uh ipod i mean the airpod earplugs that apple is selling they also now function as hearing aids. So you put the AirPods in, AirPods cost like 200 bucks, and then you play with the settings a little bit, and it has microphones actually in the AirPods. And one of the microphones is inward facing, so it's picking up the sounds that your ears are are actually hearing. And you could use these things, if you have like mild to moderate hearing loss, you can use these things as hearing kind of enhancers. You can even load your audiogram into these things, and the the Apple system will adjust the gain of the amplifiers so that you're getting an increased response in the area where you have hearing loss. So uh, it's funny. I'm kind of geeking out on this stuff. My wife thinks I'm a bit I'm a bit nuts, but she doesn't really understand the technical aspect of it it's not just that i'm concerned about my hearing it's just that i want to play with the amplifiers and the response curves well i, I wanted to share something with you about the reverse of that okay the reverse of that my wife suffers from hyperacusis very sensitive hearing so she wears earplugs all the time so in an attempt to fix this problem i had a set of custom Actually, they're like hearing aids made by Siemens. They cost me nearly two grand. And what they are is they're re reverse. When they detect a large sound, the AGC circuit closes down the volume so you don't hear it. So it's the reverse of a hearing aid, and they're made for shooters. So when you're firing a gun, you know, a very loud sound, it detects it, and it clamps off the audio. Custom made, just like the rockers use this. All, all the rock, rock and roll guys use this. She gets them and then says, it looks like I'm wearing <laughs> wearing hearing aids. I don't want people to see that. So she stopped wearing them. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah. But listen, go ahead. No, I'm just saying it's the reverse of that. Not only the hearing aids, but the shut off sound. Say, well, same well, idea. This, this is the, there's, there's another idea here, here, as long as we're on this, <clears throat> this topic. When I have the uh, the air the AirPods in, there's a little tiny switch on the side, and I can toggle the switch between noise cancellation, transparency, or off. 
So if you put it in the noise cancellation mode, yes. it's really amazing. Like I'm sitting in the in the living room with Elisa having coffee, and you're you're almost you're unaware of the kind of the noises that are around you. The refrigerator compressors go in, the dishwashers running. Man, I hit that button and it's like they disappear. They just yep. disappear. It's like the it's like the Bose headphones, but they're in AirPods. So you got the air cancellation mode. Then I hit the next, I toggle it again, and it goes to transparency. So now I'm hearing everything around me. There's a third mode that you could put in. It's called conversation focus. You hit that button and it's going to focus on whoever's in front of you, the conversation that's coming wow. from in front of you. So, I mean, it's really kind of, it's kind of interesting technology and the, and the, uh, the noise cancellation was, was pretty cool. So AirPods, man. All right. Okay. Enough. Technology. <laughs> Technology. All right. <laughs> Good stuff. Hey, um, hey, Pete, uh, uh, also in the travelogue section, a couple things to mention. We are approaching opposition with Mars. Opposition means that the sun, the earth and Mars are in a line and we're at a relatively close port point in our orbit of Mars. So the same thing happened two years ago, really at the um, in kind of mid early phase of the pandemic. Uh, back October 2020, sort of something like that. We come into opposition with Mars every 26 months. So it's been 26 months since we were last in opposition. And back in 2020, I was observing Mars quite a bit. Let me move my mic hold here a little bit. I don't, there we go. Am I sounding okay, Pete? Yeah. All right, good. So anyway, it was uh, 2020, we were uh, at opposition. And man, I, I, I was getting some really great views of Mars. So I was really looking forward to this one now, 26 months later, but I'm going out there and I'm looking at Mars and it's not as good as it was in 2020. And so I, I studied it a little bit and sure we, we, we line up with Mars, but we line up at different points in the elliptical orbits, right? So there are some oppositions that are really good that really bring Mars in close. Others, if we're at different points in the elliptical orbits, we could actually be, we're in opposition, but further away than we were on the previous one. So this morning I was comparing the uh, opposition that we had in 2020 versus the opposition that we have now. And sure enough, Mars is about one third the distance further away from us than it was in 2020. And I really notice it in my telescope. I mean, I could see surface features, but not nearly as good as I could 2020. So we might have to wait for next really 36. good opposition. You you said 36. Two years ago, you said it'll be in 2036 when we're this close. Ah, uh, okay, man. You got it. Your, your memory is like a, it's like, it's like a trap. You remember everything. 2030, you said 2036. You said, I hope I'm around. <laughs> that's what you said. <laughs> that's what you said. Yeah, but the, that's, I mean, I think that's for another really good one. We might have some, some, some ones that are, are better, but man, 2020 was good. 2020 yeah, yeah, was, was yeah. a good one. Or I might just have to get a bigger telescope. Oh, yeah. Well, of course. There you go. It, well, it gets... well, will it make a difference where you're located? Like, for instance, if you were in the DR, I don't looking in looking at that versus I where don't you're think at. so. It might it might put it might put Mars further you're up closer in... to the equator. Yeah, right? yeah, but but I think the difference there would be that it, it, Mars might be higher in the sky, which is an important factor, because I even here I notice it that when Mars is kind of low in the west. I have a tough time. I really have a tough time because I'm going. Th I'm, I'm looking through a larger portion of the Earth's atmosphere, and there's a lot of muck and gunk and and air and light pollution here. Whereas if it's it's overhead, you're 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 going through a smaller cross section of the atmosphere, and you get a better view. So it might be better from from the DR, which Pete, which brings us to our next topic: solder smoke shack south prep. Ooh. We are moving. We are moving closer. Are you close? You're close? I'm close. I'm really close. We're going to go, we're going to go um, mid month this month and spend some time down there. But, and I'm going to use it as the, um, as the kind of the first shipment. I'm going to bring down a whole suitcase full of radio stuff. And uh, we're going to spend most of the time with uh, uh, Elisa's mom and Elisa's aunt. But I'm going to have the radio stuff there and I'm going to leave it all down there so that when we come down on the follow up trips, I'll, you know, every trip I'm going to bring some more down until we're not the, the apartment that we're getting is not really ready yet. So we're going to be staying at a temporary place, but there's no, there's, I'm not wasting time. I've got the license. I am hotel India seven. 
stroke November 2 Charlie Quebec radio. Are, are you I, doing any special wiring in, in the apartment? If they're going to do some things, get some outlets at the right place, that sort of yeah, thing? We have, maybe. That's a good idea. I, I should I should start thinking about doing that. Right now, I'm just trying to make sure that they build a room for me up on the uh, on the top floor, but so the I power can, man. <laughs> yeah, I got I got to have the I got I, I just said look I I just need the shack you know I, I got to have the yeah, shack yeah so uh, we'll we'll have the shack there but um, anyway I, I and and I I'm thinking a little bit about antennas and what I want to put up there of course the the hex beam would be great but I don't know so we'll we'll have to see anyway so the solder smoke shack south <coughs> plans are are moving ahead. And as it gets colder here and darker, I start thinking, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, so off we go. Yeah. Hey, uh, Pete, speaking of travel, look what I got in my hand here, my Your friend. Bale you can fang. see it's yeah. a Balfang. It's one of, one of the hated, reviled, or or loved Balfang transceivers. I have Might one. Might not even be legal. <clears throat> I know, I know, but that's never stopped us before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Um, I, we had some visitors here. We took them out to the um, Skyline Drive in the Shenandoah National Park. And <clears throat> as I'm riding along, my Apple Watch beeps, and I can see that it's a it's a message from uh, from Dean KK4DAS. But I'm driving, and I can't stop. So I'm on the Skyline Drive. It's kind of a windy road. So we're showing our visitors the the Shenandoah Valley and the Skyline Drive. So when we stop at the next observation point where they want to get out and take a look and take some pictures. I grab my Balfang and I call on the K4 um, RC. No, I'm no, no. It's the repeater of the Vienna Wireless Society, K4 HTA, and I call it. And I just call Dean once. Boom, he comes right back. Fifty-three miles, fifty-three miles on two meters with this little rubber ducky antenna. He said I wasn't full quieting into the repeater, but it was it was kind of cool. So. I am using, <clears throat> sorry, I'm using the Baofeng, and uh, not too much, but but it's fun and uh, and and it's different. Dick so, Tracy is here. That's right. I know, but I know, but I, but I have the thing on my watch. Like I, I, I know, that's what I'm saying. Watch. Dick Tracy's here. It doesn't have a camera on it. They don't have a camera on this one. Yeah, but you can get one with the camera, <laughs> <laughs> which opens up all kinds of scary possibilities. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you got to be careful with the camera. I'm glad this one doesn't have a camera on it, but I can I can watch videos on it, but I just can't I can't transmit. But that's that's coming. Hey, speaking of the future, um, Dean especially. Dean is the president of of Vienna Wireless Society KK4 DAS, and really inspirational leadership. And he's gotten the club. In, involved in all kinds of different things. And one of the things that he's really done is he's, he's linked the club up with kind of a, a new and uh, <clears throat> nascent uh, radio club among local high school students at a local high school. It's a technology high school, so these kids are really kind of into it. But they have formed a club, and one of the first things they wanted to do is they wanted to get a bunch of the students licensed. So be, well, part of it is because they, they have launched a satellite. They built and launched a satellite. It went up with one of the SpaceX, recent SpaceX launches, and it's up there. Um, but let me just I'm gonna adjust my camera here just a bit. Hold on. Let me see. There we go. All right. Anyway, so it's it's up there. And they they did a uh, dean and, and colleagues from uh, Vienna Wireless conducted classes for these guys. 30 kids got their ham radio licenses, wow. 30 of them. And, you know, I was really pleased because they did it the right way. It wasn't just like, okay, memorize the question pool. No, they they actually conducted classes where they discussed theory and the kids really wanted to learn and they learned it and then they took the test. Not all of them passed, but but most of them did. 30 of them passed. I think the others will just take it again. But a really good effort. And so we have a new a new whole new crew of ham radio operators out there and we're going to we're following up with them and when i get back from solder smoke shack south in the uh, in the spring semester for the radio club we're going to we're going to build a uh, direct conversion receiver it's going to be all discrete all analog manhattan pine board the whole bit and the 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 the, the selling point is that yeah this is kind of old technology but at least once in your lives you should you know, build something that requires you to kind of solder and 
burn your fingers and you know <laughs> strip wires and super glue pads to the board so you'll get a feel for for how all of this works and then you know when you become you know a professional engineer and you're dealing with much more high tech equipment much more integrated circuit much more computer oriented stuff at least you will have built this one thing the other thing we we said is we told them we said that as new radio amateurs man the fact that you will have built a receiver will put you so far ahead of everybody i mean even the arrl for for years was saying that that building a receiver was something that was just too hard for your typical radio amateur well we're going to let them do it they're going to build a 40 meter direct conversion receiver and they're going to have an amazing, amazing time with it. So anyway, that's the, that's what's been happening travel log wise, Pete. You, you know, the thing is, though, uh, Bill, with the direct conversion receiver, it is so much better than a regen. You know, the, the regen oh. used to be the go to circuit. That was a piece of crap. I mean, it's like night and day. So, I mean, not only is it going to be building a project, but once they hear the presence and once they see how good it is, then there's yeah. a satisfaction. I mean, you build a regen, it squeals all over the place and drifts and everything else, and just crap. Well, you know, you know, Pete, I've had conflicted re- relationship with uh, with regens for many years. Yes, it's it kind of a, a love hate thing, but with hate far outweighing the love. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. So I agree with you completely. I always, you know, people say, "Oh, yeah, a beginner's project. You should make them build a regen." And I said, oh, "Man, if you if you never want them to build anything again." Yeah, yes. but it, but if you want to have a successful project, go with the direct conversion receiver. Now, Dean and I have actually come up with a way to sort of combine the joy of the Michigan Mighty Might with the the extreme satisfaction of a direct conversion receiver. And I know you did something like this with your build something project, but here's what we want to do. We're going to build the uh, the direct conversion receiver in stages. We're going to build it on four separate boards, and these are the four stages that that Farhan talks about: a, a filter, a bandpass filter, amplifier, the AF amplifier, the mixer, which we're going to use a diode ring, and and then finally the the RF oscillator, the VFO. In, in, our, in this case, we're going to use a PTO, but we're going to have them build the PTO first. So, and the, we're going to get it going first. We're going to get it going so that they can listen to it on a shortwave receiver that they have, or even look at the output on a scope, many of which they have. And so the, almost like on the first or probably the second day of the project, they will have, in essence, built a Michigan Mighty Might. And that PTO oscillator will serve as kind of the beating heart of literally the beating heart of the, um, not literally, but almost like the beating heart of the uh, the direct conversion receiver. Then we'll build the other stages, put the whole thing together. And and then they will have built a receiver, but they will have also experienced JOO, the joy of oscillation. Even yeah. JOVO, the joy of variable oscillation. So, so pretty cool stuff. Um, speaking of the receiver, Pete, Here's something that came up, and I wanted to ask you about this because it never happened with me before. So we, Pete, I I built one, and I, I think for those of us who are look, those guys who are looking at uh, um, at the video portion of this podcast, you could see it. I have it back on the bench over here. That that's it. I built the receiver, and Dean built the receiver, and we've been going forth back and forth, comparing notes on which circuits work best, which diplexers work best, which audio amplifiers are most appropriate. So, and, and we've been guided by um, a desire for simplicity, ease and reproduction to avoid any kind of complex circuitry that might be hard to understand for a beginner. So, and, and but we also want good performance. We want to avoid what you just described with the regen where, you know, it, <laughs> it's squeals. hard to use, it doesn't work right, it squeals. No, we don't want any of that. So we've, we've got it. So then we said, okay, we need to get it into kind of a, a for real schematic that people can easily read. So Dean started doing it with some CAD software that he had. And I think it it was kind of problematic. And I said to Dean, I said, look, what I usually do when I need a schematic that's sort of presentable, I just build it in LT Spice and use the LT Spice as, and I see you've got one in the background there. You're probably doing the same thing. Um, 
use that as sort of the the drawing software and then just do a screenshot from lt spice and boom bob's your uncle you got your uh you know you got your schematic so i was doing that and then i was doing it by stages and you know you're going along first to build the audio amplifier and then i think okay let me just check make sure the audio amplifier works in lt spice yep it does then i built the bandpass filter okay let me see the bandpass filter works all four stages the last stage that i built and that I really didn't expect to work was the PTO because I've built a lot of oscillators in LT Spice, but I've never had them sort of work for me to take off, you know, to go and actually, you know, function. And so I'm building this thing and I, I'm just finishing it. And I, I had it, I had the, the thing set up in LT Spice. So I really didn't need the PTO to work because I just put another voltage source going into the audio amplifiers, right? Or, yeah, I think, or, or going, no, going into the mixer. I, I, had going, I, had the, I had sort of replaced the PTO with an RF source that you could do in LT Spice. It went into the mixer and it was all working. But then I said, wait a second, let me just take a look at the output on the, uh, on the, on the PTO and see what it looks like. The, the darn thing was oscillating in LT Spice. Wow. The PTO came alive. <clears throat> I mean, I had this moment where you're suddenly looking at the screen and you realize that the receiver that you built not only works in the real world, but is also working in LT Spice. So I immediately, boom, I took out the little voltage source that had replaced the PTO. And in LT Spice, I ran a lead down from, from the PTO buffer output to the mixer local oscillator input. Pete, it worked. Not only that, I start playing around with the RF input that's coming in from the antenna going into the bandpass filter. And sure enough, as I put the signal with the appropriate frequency and level in there, I'm seeing the output, right? So if, in other words, if I have the PTO, the PTO turned out <coughs> was set at like 7078 kilocycles, right? And if I put <coughs> an RF signal in there at 7079, one KC up, right? I should see a 1KC audio right. output. It works. Boom. The whole thing works. So I was joking with Dean. I, I said to him, it's, it was almost like the, this, uh, you know, the Frankenstein moment where you, the, the, the mad professor sits back and says, it is alive. It is alive. It is alive even in LT Spice. Dean was, Dean was joking with me. Dean, Dean, who is a real, a real serious software guy, he said to me, oh, my God, he said, all you need is to figure out a way to get get RF signal in there and audio out, and we will have built uh, an SDR radio. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I think that's that that's coming. We we're really we're really pleased with the project. You know, it's kind of an amalgam of uh, of contributions from different people. You know, the bandpass filter is straight out of um, QRP Labs, Hans Summers. And he he has the circuit diagrams, and it's it's just a dual tuned circuit. But it's really cool to have, you know, kind of working model there that you could just take from it. So we we did that. The uh, the mixer we played around with different kinds of mixers, but we eventually went with the diode ring. And I know you've been a fan of the diode ring for a long time. We put that in there. We have kind of a special problem here because of AM detection, AM breakthrough, and the. The, the the diode ring helped a lot in, in cutting down on AM detection, but we were still getting a lot of AM breakthrough from one particularly kind of troublesome transmitter for us here on the East Coast, and that's the Radio Marti, Radio Marti transmitter directed at Cuba out of Greenville, North Carolina. It's um, 250 kilowatts, comes on in the morning, comes on in the evening, and, Dean, and, it, and it's right above the 40 meter band. Usually it's around 7355 kilohertz, right above. So if 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 you don't have the the direct conversion receiver set up right, when when Radio Marti fires up, it'll start coming through, and you'll start hearing it playing in the background. It's kind of annoying. I mean, I like it because it's you know it's Spanish, it's fun, but they have all kinds of crazy stuff. They they play a rooster during the morning show. And so Dean and I'll be listening and you're trying to listen to 40 meter sideband or 40 meter CW and all of a sudden you hear <laughs> <laughs> radio Martinez <laughs> rooster is fired up. Yeah. So we start playing around with a, 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 a diplexer or a diplexer at the output of the diode ring. 
And we ended up going with uh, a real simple four parts, just four parts that Roy Llewellyn, W70L, oh, yeah. used in his optimized uh, transceiver. And when we put those things in there, man, that basically killed Radio Marti's rooster. We killed the rooster. <laughs> We've been talking to, um, to, to Nick, M0NTV, Nick the Vic. Um, and he's been, he's been playing around with DC receivers too. And so I said to him, man, I said, Nick, why don't you do some, uh, AM breakthrough testing for us and see what happens, see what, oh, yeah, what, what you, where you can problem. get the best results, man. He, he, he said diode ring with the W7EL mixer with the W7EL diplexer. So that's what we went with there. Um, then for the, uh, for the audio amplifier, let's see, I've just got, we, oh no, no, no. Let me tell you, tell you about the, 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 the PTO. The PTO, which is really the heart of the thing, really came from Farhan. Farhan is involved in a similar project in Hyderabad, where he's teaching school kids at, at girls' schools in the Hyderabad area to make um, direct conversion receivers. Now, he came up with a receiver circuit, super simple, coal pits. It uses um, a, a, a variable inductor as the PTO. But get this, the feedback network, the two capacitors that are in the feedback network for the culpits are also the frequency determining element in the LC circuit that determines the frequency. I had never seen anything like this. And I, I was kind of skeptical when Dean showed it to me, but it works. It works really well and it is super stable. I mean, it's amazing how with just few, few parts, I think, I think we're talking like 10 parts. You could make a PTO and you don't, we didn't do any of the kind of NPO capacitors and, you know, many capacitors in parallel and, you know, hermetically sealed metal boxes or anything like that, man, this thing just sits there and it's so stable. It's one of the most stable uh, uh, variable oscillators that I've ever built. We combined it with a, a simple buffer. The buffer that we used is a single J310 FET. And it comes out of um, the schematic for a different oscillator that Farhan built. Farhan built a, another oscillator for his Daylight Again transceiver. But we just took the circuit for the, the buffer. And that, that is really simple. That's like four or five parts. And we put it in there. And that gave us enough output. We needed like 7 dBm to drive the diode ring mixer. And it, the, that, that buffer provides enough so that it drives the diode ring mixer properly. So the, the, um, I, I was joking with Dean that the, uh, the, the, the PTO and the buffer is extremely far Harian. It's a far Harian buffer. There you go. There you go. It's a new term. <clears throat> yeah, I, I want, you know, I want Steve, uh, Steve, <laughs> Steve Silverman to note that, that our lexicographer, it's, um, it's a, it's a far Harian oscillator. Finally, the, the audio amplifier is, um, it's super simple. Now, when Wes Hayward built his first transistorized DC receiver back in November 68, he used three transistors in the AF amplifier. These were the only gain stages. And this is the only gain stages, the only active gain stages that we have in this, in this rig. But he had three transistors just sort of coupled together with one kind of a bias loop going back, providing a little bit of negative feedback. Um, we've used, I've used that circuit before and we thought about using it, but we thought that it was a little bit, because of the negative feedback, it might be a little bit less simple than we wanted. It might be a little bit more complicated than we wanted. So we instead went with three common emitter AF amplifiers uh, cascading with, uh, with a gain control between the first amp and the second amp. And this provides, oh, it provides more than enough gain. It provides something like 90 dB a gain. And uh, we, we usually have to crank it down quite a bit with the uh, the gain control. But it's simple. It's easy to build. It doesn't squeal. And the, I think the students will have no trouble getting their, their heads around how this thing is operating, which is an important part of, of the project. We also put a gain control, an RF gain control, at the antenna terminal. So between the antenna terminal and the bandpass filter, we have a 10K pot that allows us to crank down the uh, the gain at going into the whole receiver, which is sometimes useful if you have a really powerful 
you know, broadcast station close by, you can you could just knock it down quite a bit there. So we've been really, I mean, I've I've been amazed, Pete, about how much you can learn, even as a, a fairly experienced builder, when when you start really digging into a direct conversion receiver, then you're you're looking at those four stages that are really the heart of everything we build, those four stages that Farhan talks about, the four boards that we're going to use in this project. And it's been really educational. I, I've learned a hell, heck of a lot. And so is, has Dean. And, and so many people have been chiming in. I, I put the schematic that I mentioned, I put it up on the blog and I put it up. Also, I put the, the net list of the, uh, the LT Spice model. So Hopefully you guys can download that, take a look at it in LT Spice and see it come alive the way the way that I did. But um, it's 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 been, it's been been a lot of fun. Oh yeah. Hey, I want to make one input in it, just something that uh, I always used to see, but I never never needed to do that. But if you look at stuff that uh, Dema and Hayward did, you'll notice on the front end they usually have a network that actually nulls out broadcast interference. In other words, like the bandpass filter, they'll also have a, in cascade with that, a, a broadcast filter so that you you delete the signal from even coming into the circuit. So- Like for the take, AM broadcast, the AM yeah, broadcast yeah, band, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so you, yeah. Would see, you would see the bandpass filter for the band in use, but you also had in series with that an AM filter, and I said, why do they do that? Well, I, I never had, where, where I was located, I never had the problem, but like on the East Coast, so certainly the diplexer is an answer, but you also might have to have some brute force beyond that. So you yeah, might look definitely. through, look through your, your Wes Hayward and Doug DeMaw, and you'll see you, you'll see that, and you see, why, why am I going to build all, all this extra network for it? And it was because broadcast breakthrough, especially with direct conversion receivers. You know, I had to do that once. The only time I had to do that here was when I was building Rick Campbell's phasing receiver, which basically is two direct conversion receivers yes. to produce the INQ signals. So it's a, a phasing signal. And, and I discovered that, man, I was getting crushed here by the the uh, the religious broadcaster, which is one mile to my east, WFAX, you know, during the uh, during the day, I think it goes up to something like uh, it's something like 5000 watts out AM. It, it's so powerful that with my 160 meter inverted L. It would move the it would move the <laughs> SWR meter. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, there's a lot of juice coming out of that thing. So that's a good idea. I, I don't we might be able to get away without it here. And what, uh, you just, know, one of the things we're doing is I feel like we're muncing. We're we're like we're, yeah. we're, uh, Dean and I joke that we're like the munsters. You know, when when Munz used to go into the TV and pull out a capacitor, and if it still worked, he'd throw the capacitor away. <laughs> but I think we're we're down this whole thing is built, we can build it with about 46 parts, about 46 parts, which is, which is pretty darn good, especially if you're building it. And this is something that, uh, that we emphasize and, and I'm really pleased that, that Nick M0 NTV in his, his, his speech, his talks to clubs in the UK emphasizes the importance of kind of modulization of building it, not as one big schematic, but is build is breaking the schematic up into stages and building it it that way and testing the stages before you move on to the next one. So that's what we're, we're going to be, we're going to be doing. And, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it's uh, the, I, I, and actually, you know, we're, we're kind of thankful that we have radio Marti just above the 40 meter band because it, it's it provides sort of kind Source. of a, a friend, a friendly nemesis to test. Yes. AM break designs. Yes. Yep. And it, and if, if if we're able to get rid of almost all of Radio Marti, then we're in pretty good shape. I mean, I had another incident where there's another free there's another station that comes up even closer to to 40 meters, and it's Vatican Radio. Ooh. It fires up at 7305. 7305. <sighs> with listen, also 250 kilowatts. Also out of Greenville, North Carolina, the same, the same site. They're just leasing the site. Now, Radi Vatican Radio only fires up for about 15 minutes. It's only on the air for 15 minutes. But, 
and they they don't radio marti beams directly south into havana uh, vatican radio beams slightly to the southeast because they're trying to hit most of spanish-speaking latin america it's a spanish-speaking broadcast but man when that thing fires up it is every bit as powerful maybe even more powerful than radio marti and i was i was fooling around i i had my antenna hooked up to the tiny SA spectrum analyzer. And I could see, I, I, I suddenly realized that I was looking at both Vatican radio and wow. radio Marti. I could see them on the tiny SA. And then I looked over at the clock and I saw the clock and it said 744 local time. I knew that radio Va Vatican radio shut down. I think it's 1244 UTC. And Vatican Radio shuts down at 12:45 UTC. So I had the I had the camera rolling. I had the camera on the phone going, and I said to myself, "Man, that thing's going to disappear within a minute." And I look and I'm, I'm looking, and sure enough, about 15 seconds later, you see that blip at 73:05 go boop, gone. Radio Vatican Radio signed off for the day, and I could I caught it on the tiny SA. I put it up on the blog. It was just great fun. Um, so, so, and I never did that before, but Pete, this is something I want to talk to you about now. This is the first kind of lesson learned from playing with this receiver. Now we all know that you can't listen satisfactorily to a double sideband receiver, double sideband transmitter on a direct conversion receiver. You can't now. One of the other great benefits of being in a club like Vienna Wireless is that you're interacting with other guys who are interested in this stuff, too. And sometimes they'll hit you with really good questions. So we were showing our receivers at, at lunch one time, and one of the guys came up, Mike Danhart, came and said, well, you're so close. Can't you just use it for AM broadcast reception? You know, get AM. Or the AM, the amateur radio AM at the high end of 40 meters, you know, at 7295. And I just said, no, you can't. You really, because AM sounds terrible on a direct conversion receiver. But then he asked a kind of a, a good question. Why? Why? Why does it sound yeah. bad? So this, 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 and I said, well, it, it's, it's probably for the same reason that you can't listen to a double sideband suppressed carrier transmission on AM with it, with a direct conversion receiver. It's probably the same reason, but I, I, I realized that I didn't really fully understand it. And I've been struggling with this on and off. So Pete, this launched me into the world of Googling and noodling. Now you, 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 you brought us the term noodling, but I'm going to combine it, combine it. Google noodling. And Google so noodling, yes. Go, Google go. noodling. And so I'm sitting there just thinking about the whole thing and thinking about what happens as a double sideband signal with a suppressed carrier, assume the carrier is completely gone, comes into a product detector because the, the direct conversion receiver is, is essentially a product detector. It's that diode ring mixer. What happens to the sidebands? What goes on there? And it, it, it was, it, I had forgotten something that happens. And I'm, I'm ashamed to say that I forgot this. I forgot the Hallis rule, sideband side inversion. inversion. So you got the two sidebands coming in but one of them is being subtracted from the oscillator frequency, and that one inverts. So now you have both sidebands coming out sort of at the same point. Everything, suppose you have a one kilohertz audio signal modulating a seven megahertz carrier. At the output, what you're hoping for is also a one kilohertz audio tone. If your variable frequency oscillator is exactly, exactly on frequency and in phase with the carrier oscillator that produced this signal, boom. Then when it does the uh, inversion, it comes in exactly right, it overlaps and everything is fine, it sounds great. However, if you're slightly off in frequency, they don't line up properly and they start to beat together and you start hearing this kind of thump, 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 thump as, it, as it goes through. LT Spice let me kind of test this because in LT Spice, I could say, okay, let's take a look at a double sideband signal coming in and I'm going to just move the oscillator slightly off. Pete, you know how slightly off I moved it? One hertz. 
one hertz. So the so the, the carrier oscillator that's producing the double sideband signal is at say 7100, 7100. And I changed the, the carrier oscillator to 7100.001, one hertz off. You and I joke about the, the, the SDR guys who complain that we're 40 hertz off. I just moved it one hertz off and I wanted to see an LT spice if I could see distortion in the audio output, big time. If, if there's an error uh, as small as one hertz, you'll get distortion. So this thing works, you, you can theoretically get it to work in AM or double That's side band, be. but you gotta be right on. And not only that, not <clears> only do you have <throat> to be right on in frequency, Base. Phase. It's got to be of the same phase as the carrier. Again, it's technologically possible. There are circuits that allow you to do this. Somebody mentioned the Costa loop, but I was, I, I, I put a, I put a lot of this stuff up on the blog, and I said, you know, if any of you guys think that I might be able to tune my direct conversion receiver with the PTO to within one hertz of a carrier that I can't even hear. <laughs> Take a look at my frequency readout. This is the frequency readout that I use with the oh, direct yes. conversion receiver. Yeah, that's, right? that's really fine gradations. <laughs> I'm lucky if I get within 100 hertz yeah. with, with 100 kcs. <laughs> Forget about 100 hertz. So anyway, this was it was really a kind of kind of a, an interesting Google noodling session, and I I, I learned a lot. And uh, you know, a lot of guys suggested, oh yeah, I just need a synchronous uh, detector with a Costa loop. And I said, well, yeah, but the synchronous detector with the Costa loop will be orders of magnitude more complicated than the receiver we're trying to build. So maybe you should just say, okay, it works great with SSB and CW, where it doesn't matter if you're a little bit off, right? It's not going to distort. It's going to sound good. It might sound a little bit higher, a little bit lower. That's fine. But man, once you get into a double sideband signal coming into a DC receiver, you're in trouble. It's not working well. You know what uh, was crossing my mind as you were talking there is the phasing transmitters of of the 1930s and 40s, or I should say 40s. If if you were slightly off, the signal didn't sound right. In other words, the phase shift network was not exactly 90 degrees, so you're not not getting the fa that phase shift that you need for quadrature. So, I mean, I think the, the reason that the filter took over is that eliminated that problem. But now with digital techniques, you can get that 90 degrees straight on. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I did with the, um, with, with the <clears throat> Campbell receiver that I built. You know, I built it using uh, SI5351. SI and here also with our with our Regal scopes that we have, they will allow you to measure phase. Yes. So I was able to take a look, and I noticed exactly what you said, that on the receive side, when I had the oscillator tuned that was producing I and Q, the same signal but 90 degrees shifted, if, if I had it set so that it was, in fact, 90 degrees off, the thing worked great. Carrier suppression was really good. The signal sounded great. If I messed around with it a little bit and I had a phase shift of say 87 degrees, yes, boom, not good, not good. Yeah, same, so same yeah, problem. it's it requires a lot of precision. And I guess if we're if we're in the world of of PTOs and and simple you know seven components, um, we better just say okay, look, there's a restriction. You really you shouldn't expect to listen to AM well or double sideband well. I mean, I joked one time. I said you know. This is not really a problem because the likelihood of running into another double sideband signal <laughs> on the airwaves these days is practically non-existent. You'll, if you're on the air with a double sideband transmitter on 20 meters, You'll know you're it. almost certainly the only one in the world right. transmitting that right. way. I speak from from experience here. Um, but um, it's it, it, also one thing I wanted to say is that Peter Parker down there in Melbourne, VK3YE. He's done a lot of work on this. I remember when I first got involved in, in double sideband, Peter was like the guru because he had started several years before I did. And he's still a great guru on this kind of stuff. But 
he has a video, and I put it up on the blog, in which he is testing a double sideband transceiver. And he, he finds some Australians who will transmit to him on double sideband. So he's attempting to demonstrate that it's possible to receive double sideband on a direct conversion receiver. And I, I, I listened to it, and my conclusion was, yeah, you can, but it's, it's as, as DeMoor and as Wes Hayward points out, it's not satisfactory. It's, it sounds distorted. You can hear the thumping, the thumping that I described. You, you, where you're getting close, but there's, there's, there's this kind of thump, 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 thump on the signal, kind of a flutter on the signal that is, that is distortion. Now, the interesting thing on that video is that Peter, uh, the video that I have up on the blog, <clears throat> he's trying to tune in these, these, these double sideband signals with his, double, with his direct conversion receiver. They're distorted. Later in the video, he tries to tune in the same signals using an SSB receiver that's only getting one of the sidebands. He's, he's not using the other one. They sound great. The distortion problem disappears, which kind of proves the point. Yes. Now, I, I did the same thing here. I, was, I had some, was listening to some AM stations with the Drake 2B, and if I had it set so that I was getting both sidebands through the passband of the Drake 2B, both sidebands are coming through. I turn on the product detector and the BFO and I zero beat. So I'm at zero beat, but both sidebands are coming through and it sounds distorted. Same signal. I, and with the BFO and product detector on, I switched. So I'm only getting one sideband through. So I switched to say the 2.6 KC situation and I tune the, you can move the pass band on the Drake 2B. So I move it. So I'm only getting, I'm only detecting the lower sideband, not the upper sideband. And at that point, it sounds great because I'm, I'm, I'm in essence listening to an SSB signal, right? So anyway, this is the kind of thing that really lends itself to a lot of noodling and doodling. Noodling and Googling. <laughs> doodling. <laughs> hey, uh, well, one, there's one other thing. This, these, these kind of questions from the Vienna Wireless guys got me thinking about something else. And that is, okay, it, we've talked about the difficulty of, of listening to double sideband signals. But how do we really, how do we make it work with plain old AM? You know, diode detectors. We've been using diode detectors for years. And the question is, are they functioning as envelope detectors or are they functioning as square law detectors? What's the difference between the two? I never really got into this, but I'm, I'm studying it. I'm Googling and noodling, and I'm planning on doing a blog post in the next week or so about what the difference is, how they really work, and why it is that a diode detector lets us do with an AM signal what we really can't do with a, a product detector at the same bandwidth. So it's it's kind of fun, and it, uh, it, it requires you to dig into the literature. Hey, Pete, one thing I also mentioned, this gets us to the benefits of writing. And you, you have written so much stuff over the years for different ham radio publications but I think about you when I think about this, but um, when I was writing about PTOs, permeability tuned oscillators on the blog, uh, Michael Black up in Canada wrote and said, hey man, why don't you dig into the archives of 73 Magazine and find some old PTO articles? And I did. I found one particular, there weren't too many, but I found one particularly good one from 1967. Wow. 1967. This guy built a PTO oscillator, and he wrote this really fantastic article about his experiences in building it. And I read it, and I read, I learned a lot from it. And it was almost like the voice of this guy was coming back from 1967. He was sharing tribal knowledge that he had developed in the mid 1960s, and here we are, 55 years later you know, benefiting from it. And I, I, it made me really grateful that this guy had written the article and had taken what he had learned and really made it permanent. You know, there might be people 55 years from now who are reading this thing. I, I, we, we, some of the guys in Vienna Wireless and I have been talking about how coherers, how Marconi's coherer actually works. And I go back and I dig into the Gernsback literature and go back and look at the old stuff. It's interesting to read this stuff. Didn't I found that come a, from the French. Well, uh, I'm sorry. 
didn't the cohere detector come from the French? I'm not sure. I, th I they, it's always so, sort of attributed to Marconi because Marconi was using one during his first transatlantic test. But I, I thought the French invented it, and he ah, just there you up go. A, yeah. Hey, some of that stuff he just stole. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, okay. yeah, yeah, maybe. No. But anyway, um, there was a there was another article I found in there in the similar search. Sort of, you know, sometimes when you're looking at one thing, you start looking at what else is in the magazine. And there was a, an article in there from 1966. Some guy had decided that he liked the Drake 2B so much that he was going to build a solid state version of the Drake 2B. He called it the 2Q. And then the front panel of this thing, it looked it looked just like a Drake 2B but it was completely transistorized. I think he used 22 transistors to get this thing going. I, I, shared, I shared it with a guy, with Dale Parfit, W4OP. Yeah, Dale. Who had a similar project. I said, Dale, had you seen this thing? He said, no, I never saw it. This is fantastic. But again, this guy wrote it up in 1966, 1967, and here we are benefiting from it. So there's a there's a benefit in, and, and we could do this these days. It's like, you know, cross generational or across the decades sharing of, uh, of of tribal knowledge. So great stuff and, and a lot of fun. Hey, Pete. Shameless Commerce Division. Yes, <clears throat> we got to do that, man. We got to make some money here. You know, first of all, I want to mention Parts Candy. Our friend Carlos in Chicago continues to churn out great leads test leads that you need around the shack. I bought, I got an extra set of them that I'm sending down to the solder smoke shack South. Pete, I know you've got them and you've used them. Oh, they're, yeah. neat, they're, they're really neat. They're Herb. good stuff. Don't scrimp with a crimp. Go with Carlos's, Carlos's test leads. I got the link up there on the blog. It's up on the right hand column. Just click on it. And he's got all kinds of different products too, that you'll find useful around the shack and just go for it. But the one I really want to talk about now is another one of our sponsors, and that's Mostly DIY RF by our friend Todd out there in uh, in Portland. And his link is on the right-hand side. You'll see it there. Just click on that. It'll take you to his website. But he's doing some really innovative stuff. He's got a bunch of QER crystal filters. He had them available as bare printed circuit boards, but he's going to now start offering kits or assembled and tested SSB filters at different frequencies. Four Pete. different frequencies. Yeah. The first one is as a result of your input, my friend, at 4.9152, which will make it useful on 17 meters, right? Right. Okay. Also hey, on before, 9 megahertz, before, which is a before, great frequency, but not good for, for 17. Before you move from the 4.9152. Yeah. The K2, the K2 from Elecraft used that IF, that same IF frequency. So if you got one of them filters, you can go to the K2 circuits and start stealing some of the parts and pieces out of Elecraft and use that filter. So you're all set. So that's a great frequency. That's a good good frequency. You can use their their circuitry absolutely. Then then of course the uh, the ever present nine megahertz filter, which we, we're all surrounded by nine <clears> megahertz <throat> filters, but not not as you as you point out many times, not good for seventeen. Also, 11.059 and 12 megahertz filters. I've used all of those at different points. Um, and he, Todd says, he would like to hear from anyone who either wants or can suggest other frequencies. So anybody who can suggest other frequencies for these kinds of filters, please let Todd know. He says at the moment, he's not planning to offer CW filters because he thinks that adjustable bandwidth SCAF audio filters are much more flexible. This is an approach that I use with my micro bit X. I just put the, I took advantage of the, um, you know, the single sideband feature, but then I just threw in an audio filter to narrow it down when I'm, I'm using CW. So yeah, let Todd know if you have any suggestions for other frequencies for the um, SSB uh, filters, but here's something really exciting. I like this for the holidays and beyond. Every order greater than $25 submitted with the code. There's a code, CBLA. CBLA is the code. For those of you who might not have been listening for a long time, it might not be clued in, might not be among the Illuminati of Solder Smoke, Pete. Mm. CBLA stands for the Color Burst Liberation, Liberation Army. Army. 
you know, we're being investigated by the federal authorities because of the CBLA. Ooh, wow. You know, I hope it works out okay. We'll let you know sometime in April. Um, but um, anybody who submits an order greater than $25 and includes in the order the code CBLA will receive, get this free, a Michigan Mighty Might kit. <laughs> it's going to be a challenge kit. No PCB, just the parts, coil wire, bare copper clad board, isolation pads, and plastic coil former. And customers must supply their own super glue for the isolation pads. But you can do it, my friends. You can do it. Send in the order to Todd, include the CBLA code, and get your free Michigan Mighty Might. All right, Todd also says that he's interested in hearing from people who have suggestions for PC, PCBs and or kits. Not only would I like to know more about ham interest and demand, he wants to also encourage engagement with potential customers. And if you just go to the, the website, mostlydiyrf.com, or click on the contact button, and click on the contact button to submit their ideas, you could also reach the website through our, um, uh, our, our the Star Smoke blog. It's up there. On the on the right hand side, um, a couple other things in shameless commerce. As long as we're at it, Pete, um, our YouTube goal has been reached. Thanks, Ooh. thanks everybody. We've gone more than four thousand hours, significantly more, of watch time. So keep on watching. So, so um, you got I'm that still... program working with the girls and? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't. We didn't go that way. As a matter of fact, I have scaled back. Because this gets to gets to another point. I, I put I put a few ads on the Solder Smoke blog, and the ads are really driven by Google's kind of demographic or 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 web search <clears throat> knowledge of the user, not me, the user. And, but I, I got some reports that some ads that were well, let's say less than wholesome, less than family kind of ads were popping up on people's screen. We don't want that. So I went and, and Google will provide you with a whole bunch of filters that you could say, none of these ads, none of those ads, none of these ads. So I put on a whole bunch of filters. So now there's a whole bunch of ads, I think, from DigiKey and um, and uh, Mauser and electronics parts suppliers and various forms of, uh, you know, Home Depot and stuff. So nobody should be offended by that stuff. Anyway, I, I we, we've cleaned up our act there, and I hope those ads are uh, are, um, are are OK now. Um, and soon I think we'll have some, some ads popping up on the YouTube channel, but it takes a while. These, these systems are kind of clunky and you got to put code in the blog and everything else, but everything else, everything is fine. Uh, keep buying from Bezos using the link on the upper, on the right-hand column of the blog page. Right now I have a couple of pictures of, uh, regal scopes just because they look cool, but you can search for anything there. Any, put, put anything you want to search for there. As long as you begin the search there, boom. Bezos has to send us some money, which is always helpful. Um, I, I also, share think some, about. Go ahead. I got to share some with you about what pops up. My my brother in law expressed some interest in a CNC machine, and uh -huh. my sister said, "Hey, I might want to get him one for Christmas. Could you recommend something?" So I went searching for CNC machines. <laughs> now every day on my phone or on my computer, a pops an ad for a CNC machine. So, I mean, they have got you nailed. I mean, if you start searching for something, especially do one or more than one or two searches, that's going to show up. <laughs> this, is, this is like this is like the old Chinese proverb. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Pete, imagine if you had searched for something else. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, they would follow you forever. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, we've gotten rid of most of the things like. Um, Oh, I don't know, dating sites and pharmaceuticals yeah. of various kinds. You know, we don't want to get into the details, but we got rid of most of that stuff. <laughs> However, your mileage may vary, as they yes. say. So, yes. so careful, be, be careful, careful out what there. You search for. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, listen. Some other, one other thing, really kind of cool. The Patreon sponsors. We have Patreon sponsors for solder, solder smoke, and there's a link to this in the upper left hand column. It's really kind of a cool way to do it. And I, I try to send as much content as stuff that I can to the Patreon sponsors. And and we've we've got a, a, a kind of a really loyal and supportive group there over there on Patreon. Think about becoming a Patreon sponsor. It's in the left-hand column of the blog, blog page. 
But um, yeah, that's it. That's our shameless commerce division for for the month, Pete. Which brings us, Pete, Pete Spench. I know you you've been busy, man. You've been busy with other stuff, but but I'm oh, amazed yeah. that you still manage to get stuff out, comments and everything else. So so tell us. I mean, I I put a few things here that I know you've been working on. You might not be fully aware of how busy you've been with ham radio. Yes, yes. Well, that's probably gonna gonna change uh, quite dramatically. <clears throat> I, I think uh, those who have followed the podcast uh, realize uh, my ex yl has been in the hospital and next week coming home. Now, that doesn't that's very good because most of my days, as a matter of fact, when we finish here, I got to get ready to go to the rehab center. So she's going to be home, but uh, e- even more demands of my time. And and it's I'm, I'm going to save the travel time to the rehab center. So uh, not much, much change. But a couple of things are noteworthy. Uh, first of um I like to talk about the eight meter band. The eight meter band. I didn't, I never thought about the eight meter band before, but the eight meter band is around 40 megahertz. And there are seven licensed stations in the United States that are testing the feasibility of this band. Now, what it offers you is uh, kind of a mix between the DX and 10 meter band and some of the special propagation features of the six meter band so it'd be kind of neat and uh, these uh, eight seven stations are transmitting a lot of digital signals like ft8 and uh, that would be kind of a neat addition and uh, i i think you can still even get an experimental license you can contact the fcc and if you do certain things you can put another station so there may be more interest now of note slovenia Slovenia has the eight meter band authorized as a regular band, and so does Ireland. So if you're in Ireland or Slovenia, you could communicate with the United States. As a matter of fact, I think there's some uh, recorded official contacts between Ireland and the United States on the eight meter band. So that that tells you something about the propagation. That it's, wow, it, it's all kinds of potential there. Can you potential. imagine even cross mode? Can you imagine? <clears throat> yeah. You, you yeah. Know? You, the U.S. station transmits on six and receives from Slovenia on eight. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, there you go. So it, that, uh, it's nice to see that there may be some new bands opening up because with the digital technologies, uh, that's kind of a natural fit, uh, a good fit for that. That, that you know, modest antennas, that's another thing. Antenna size. Just think of the much smaller antenna you have versus something on 40 or 20 meters. And also, you have the, there's no Radio Marti on the 8-meter band. <laughs> so, no more roosters. No <laughs> more roosters. So, I mean, this is kind of, I, I was totally unaware of it. And again, something showed up on my phone. A guy says, hey, I'd like to talk about the 8-meter band. I said, what's this? So, I think it's around 40.66 megahertz. And I guess if you had an SDR dongle, with some of these software programs, you could crank that up to 40.66 and see if you could hear the, the seven stations. Now, uh, I think most of the stations in the United States that are that have the experimental licenses, like in, one in Georgia, one in New Jersey, there may be one in Ohio. I don't think there's anybody out here in the left coast that's doing it, but, but there are seven authorized stations. So that'd be kind of nice to see uh, another band authorized, uh, and and that may be coming. So, had you heard anything about the eight meter band before? No, but no, but Pete, I I I I heard about it a while back, but I haven't heard more recently. But you know, um, it it also helps prepare the ground, sort of prepares the the battlefield, I think, for the reconquest of the five meter band, which yeah. we have to get working on. And that's was 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 and and some people say is. Frank Jones's uh, ultimate objective, you know, the five meter liberation army. That oh, yeah. Michael yeah. Hopkins wrote about. <clears throat> yeah. So anyway, but that would be good stuff. That'd be great. I mean, it's always good to see a new band, something new coming along. You hear guys working on the very, very low frequencies down there. And, the, and so this is this is something similar, sort of up in a, in VHF land. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so kinda, pretty cool. Kinda, kinda, kinda I think cool. It, the, have the Brits had this band for a while. Or the Brits have had it, I think. Right. I don't think so. Oh, no, the Brits have a four meter allocation. Four meter band, yeah. That's what I'm thinking about. The four meter allocation. Yeah, yeah okay. The, the only two two real countries that have it as a regularly authorized band, not experimental, is uh, Slovenia and Ireland. I, I don't know how Slovenia got it, but Slovenia. But, 
but but you know but ireland ireland has this tradition of um radio experimentation you know my yeah. old friend michael uh ei zero cl would tell me that you know when remind me that when you know when hams in ireland get their tickets it's a radio experimenters ticket it's, yeah. it's, and so there's a heavy emphasis on uh, on radio experimentation and i'm going to tell you we have we, we've got the latest edition of the connaught radio news i'll mention that once we get into the into the mailbag right but very cool okay Pete, uh, i noticed you you also you also proposed a solution to my tuning problem <laughs> yes <laughs> using a stepper motor and an arduino yes. Yes. I immediately recoiled in horror when I read about the Arduino and the stepper motor, but it's a cool idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, uh, it'll count the number of turns, so and then it'll reset it, and and you can use that turns counting to give you a display. I mean, it's like using a sledgehammer for a thumbtack, but it was fun nonetheless. You know, I'm getting ahead of myself a little <clears> bit, <throat> but because Tony Tony uh, Fishpool uh, G4WIF sent me something he had spotted on eBay kind of a mechanical turns counter that you could use. And I just realized when I saw Tony's message that I looked in my my you got junk one. box, I already have one, all right? Now, this would require a PTO mechanism that doesn't move in and out, and they are available too. Glue stick. Uh, but uh, one of these days, I'm gonna build one of these things and just put the mechanical you know, yeah. turns counter on yeah. there, and Bob will be my PTO uncle. Yeah. Uh, the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is SDR software, and uh, I found out some interesting things. There's a, a neat program called SDR Console, and this is really an elaborate uh, SDR uh, that's very uh, applicable to uh, many of the current SDR transceivers. But more importantly, it's also been set up for the dongles. So if you have one of those $12, $13 dongle lying around a desk drawer, you can download uh, the SDR console, and and man, does it give you functionality and capability. I mean, and I got to be honest with you, Bill, I can I can detect one hertz difference. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really can. You should just go on the air and just tell people, hey, man, I'm sorry, old man, you're about one hertz off. You know, yeah. Please. I, I, can you I please can't. square it? Can you yeah. Get, get your act together. I really here. can. I mean, come on. But SDR Embarrass. console, and of course, I have the uh, Proficio that I've got working. As a matter of fact, on one computer, my $76 computer, I have five different SDR programs. And it's kind of nice uh, with, these, with these radios, the two radios I have that are SDR, comer commercial SDRs, they'll operate with many of those same programs. And it's interesting to see one particular piece of software, you test the radio and say, man, this is crap. You move over to another software program and it's outstanding. So the discrimination is not not no longer the hardware. The discrimination is how good the software is. Oh man, so it's it's very, very interesting <clears throat> stuff. I'm 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 always jealous of the waterfalls. You know, yes. I like those those waterfalls are well, really cool. Well, here's one that drive you nuts. Um, you you set up a radio with a particular software program and and WWV is so useful because you can look at WWV and what you're able to do is look look at it on an AM and you'll see if the cursor lines up with the carrier, you know, directly on. Right. Then then you switch sidebands, upper sideband, lower sideband, and you if you hear no shift, you know the radio is tuned to WWV. That's right. So you can detect the shift your ears can detect the shift between upper sideband and lower sideband. If you detect no shift and it's right on 15 or right on 10 or right on 20, you know that the radio is accurate and you're close to one hertz. You go to another software program, it's five kilohertz off. Oh man. And it's, it's, so but you that to, used to be, that used to be a test for, uh, for, for old style, even like the HW 101. Yeah. And I would get the HW 101, I, I would zero beat it on some signal and then I would switch from upper sideband to lower sideband. Yeah. And if it sounded a bit different, something was not right. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, there's uh, the, the, there's some difference of programs, but the thing that's neat is most of these programs are free. Uh, at least the, f the five that I have on there are all free. So it's c kind of interesting to see and some have different functionality. Uh, I've never used to operate a box before, but, but now, uh, that's a, that's kind of a standard. Uh, I always used to operate push to talk, 
But with the SDRs, uh, Vox is so much nicer. Some of the programs do not have Vox, so it'll work well in you saying, why well, doesn't have Vox? Whereas others that have a Vox and it makes it kind of nice. So uh, what little time I had, I made tune in a, a radio on one of those programs. It is interesting to see the differences, which uh, brings me to the reason why I have an LT Spice schematic behind me. And I want to share with you a little experience and tell you about some things that I've done. Um, over a year ago, I built the P3ST, and that's the seven transistor trans transmitter. And just recently, uh, there's an IO group, just recently an IO group, uh, someone posted something says, did that thing die? Anything going on with it? I haven't, haven't seen anything with it. I said, gee, that's the first first thing I've seen on that group in six months. You know, it's like disappeared in a hole and that started a whole round of things and uh, a couple of guys posted well i had never built that there's no complete schematic he didn't have any circuit boards he didn't have any parts lists so i mean what good is that project and and i was taken back i was taken back and well, who builds in modules and and i guess the thing that i i look at this and saying you know you missed the point if, if you're saying that you can't build something because you don't have a complete schematic, you probably couldn't build if you had the complete schematic. It kind of just, it disturbed me a little bit. It disturbed yeah. me because they were they were taking uh, shots at the design and were saying that their excuse they couldn't build it was that it didn't have a complete schematic. So I said, you know, maybe that's a message to me. And so, uh, in essence, I've, I'm stopped posting on the blog. The, the blog is no more. And come January, I'm going to remove all, all the information that's on the blog. Uh, if you're not interested, I'm not going to supply it. And, and quite honestly, I don't have to sit here and defend why I don't make complete schematics. Uh, yeah, I build project and modules. If you want to look at some, I've got the websites will still be active, but the blog is no more. I'm done. Yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. I mean, and it, and it is it is very kind of frustrating and disturbing some of the messages you get. And it, on with the blog, you know, we've been doing the blog and the podcast for so many years. I, I, I occasionally get these kinds of kind of snarky kind of trolling messages. You can tell that the person <clears throat> is deliberately yeah. trying to kind of push a button or provoke or anything else. But you know what I do? I, I, I have this in, in the in the email systems. I just have these send to archive uh position so boom that person goes yeah. to archive so you, it, it's great i never hear from them again they you, just you, poof, they're gone you know it was really really interesting you mentioned about my stepper motor drive on the pto i mean that was done kind of a little bit in tongue-in-cheek say yeah this is actually work you know i got an email from a guy with a three call says you did it all wrong <laughs> so so don't tell me I did it all wrong, you know. Yeah. So I'm just saying, you know, I don't need this anymore, guys. And I don't have actually. Oh, no, I, I know. Really this, don't this, have this, time. There's, there's people who sharpshoot and snark. I, some guy wrote to me and said something like, uh, "I think I used some like uh, I, I was talking about the tiny essay, and I said that the um, bandwidth resolution, and I used the I, I the acronym BWR. And some guy wrote to me and says, "It's not BWR. It's RBW resolution bandwidth." So. I, I just I just changed it on the blog. I didn't use either acronym. I just said the resolution. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> it's so, eh, okay. <clears throat> all right, fine. But I mean, you know, like there's always there's always going to be the the sharpshooters. So yeah, I, I I like to put them in the uh, immediate to archive group. One thing, Pete, that that I I realize as I the more I do the 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 podcast and the blog over the years, man, the good guys so far outnumber the bad guys. I mean the. I, when I, when I especially when I do the mailbag, we're going to do it here in a yeah, second. Yeah. But when you do the mailbag, you realize that every every month or so, we're only hitting kind of a small portion of the people who have written to us. And some of these guys have been writing to us for, you know, 15, 20 years now. And and so there's a, there's a real community out there of of really good people who are who kind of share our interest in understanding the circuitry and building stuff and everything else. And that's 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 really really nice, and I think this this week's band um, a mailbag is a good example of that. Yeah, but I'm glad yeah. I'm glad you told us what that LT Spice thing you got behind us there is. Well, that that's a key point here in building in modules. You can take a module 
and exercise it and optimize it and tune it. If you're starting with a big schematic, you're going to have to enter that whole schematic into LT Spice. If, oh, you do I know. It, if you do it in modules, then do what you did. You took the modules, then connected them together after you, had, right. after you had looked at each individual module and said, this works good. And and to me, I, I'm sorry, but I think in block diagrams. And do you think they start, do you think any commercial manufacturer starts out with a complete schematic? They don't. You start out with a block that diagram says this block's going to do this, and then they fill in the blocks. And then finally, they capture everything in a singular schematic. So I think that's a lame excuse. I have to have a complete schematic or I can't build it. <laughs> I know. Sometimes sometimes I get, well, I'll, I'll put up on the on the, the blog something that I built. And I'll just say in, in the in the in the article, I'll say, hey, man, this is not for um, for reproduction because this is all based on just junk that I had laying around the shack. And very often I'll get a, a, a an email saying, where's the schematic? And I'll just say, read the post. I don't have one. I didn't do a schematic because it's just something I threw together here. It's just an idea. Maybe you could do something yeah. similar. Yeah. So um, but, I, you know, and I think a lot of the kind of the the uh, the nastiness that you discuss, I think. I may be I may be wrong about this, but I think some of it is is based on kind of bleed over from the computer world, frankly. Software. Yeah. Yeah, where 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 it's kind of a tradition to kind of haze the noobs or criticize harshly the noobs. And that is a real distinction that should be maintained, I think, between ham radio and the rest of the world, because we don't have that tradition. We have instead the Elmer tradition of helping the newcomers and realizing that the person you're talking to might not have as much experience or knowledge that, that you have and, and just share it because it's all a hobby. It's all for fun. It's to help the other guy enjoy it as much as, as you did. Um, so I think that's one of the things that's driving us when we work with uh, the high school kids and try to, to share with them that kind of, that kind of culture. The other thing that's different is the CQ culture. The fact that you get on the air and just call CQ and, and, and some people ask, well, why would the other person answer? Well, because it's ham radio and because we, we like to talk sure. to each other. Yeah. But, so, you know, I was struck by the fact you said this project you're going to build with the school, it has four boards and there are four modules. That's right. So that you can understand the module. And if you want to change something, you want a different bandpass filter, a different PTO, you don't you don't throw away the whole board. You no, and we're, take that we're, one we're also Dean and I are thinking that, you know, if, if if everything works out very, very well, some of these students are going to sit there and think, well, wait a second, 40 meters is nice, 20. but I have a license that lets me operate on 10. And yeah. And 10 is open. Yeah. So how can I change this thing around? <laughs> and put it on 10 meters. Well, the PTO, you might not be able to run it up on 10 meters, all right? So throw in an SI 5351, all right? And you're gonna have to change the bandpass filter, but you should, could certainly use the mixer and the audio amplifier. And then with those kind of modifications, like you said, you haven't thrown the whole thing away. Yeah. You, could keep, you could keep the PTO boards and keep the bandpass filters. If you wanna build another one, put it on 40. But there's a lot of things that you could do. If you might, if you don't like my, my little goofy, you know, cardboard index card. Where's the stepper reactor, motor? With, or the stepper <laughs> motor. Or I, I also, I liked your idea about the prism. So you could look yeah. at it directly and look down. I'm, yeah. I might try the prism thing. But others might want, and Dean has been doing this, hook up one of these Sanjian frequency counters, right? Hook it up. But as long as you do think of it in, in modules and, and not think of it as just this massive schematic, you could do all these kind of modifications. I mean, look, I, 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 I tried and failed to do it the other way. I mean, that's that was why I failed in my effort to build the Herring 8.5 as a teenager, because I just looked at that schematic and decided to throw a whole bunch of parts on a board. And I, I never I never even saw it as different stages i could if i had seen it as in, in a modular form as different stages i would have realized that the oscillator just wasn't oscillating <laughs> i could have figured that out but i didn't because i didn't look at it that way okay so i, I think this the modular thing is the way to go and i'm really i think you're right actually and in, in, completely right in, in pushing that kind of stuff so pete should we get to the mailbag yes all right so listen like i said a lot of great mail coming in we get we heard from somebody we haven't heard for a long from a long time, Alan Yates, Victor Kilo to Zulu Alpha Yankee. I'm happy to report he is now also Whiskey Seven Zulu Alpha Yankee. Alan Yates, 
an old time wizard, the guy who inspired our construction of trivial electric motors many years ago. I wrote to him because trivial electric motors had popped up again on Hackaday and I have it up on the blog. Uh, somebody on the BBC was making trivial electric motors, much like the one that Alan made many, many years ago. He's poor Alan. He, he, he suffered a broken ankle. He's recovering from it, but you know, Every dark cloud is a silver lining. And he said it might provide some more time for him to look at ham radio stuff. And I hope he does. But we hope you you recover from the broken ankle very quickly, uh, Alan. Uh, we got an email from an old friend, Daka Jack. Daka Jack, Alpha India 4 Sierra Victor, formerly of Cyprus, Madagascar, and Northern Virginia. A member of the Vienna Wireless Society. Uh, Jack has been in communication with us from various DX locations. He has moved to France. He's living Ooh. on a villa in France <laughs> and and getting on the air from France. So we hope to work him. I, I always remember Jack one time I got on, on straight key night with my HT37 and there was a signal. I couldn't hear it too well. I didn't re realize it was Jack. And he was telling me that your HT37 has presence even on CW. And I sat back and I said, who the hell is telling me that my <laughs> HD37 has pre it was it was Jack. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Another old friend, John WB5OAU. Uh his new new call sign is K5MO. We used to talk to him years ago on the Glowbugs mailing list um or Fire Bottles mailing list. I think it was Glowbugs. And he and I was were comparing notes and he, he mentioned that he had been reading AB5L, Michael's uh, FMLA writings, and I have these on the blog too. And he said he got a real kick out of this stuff. This is the five meter Liberation Army fictional work, but a lot of it really relevant to stuff that we talk about. And he and John came up with a term for all of this that I really like that's called glow bugs noir. There glow you go. bugs noir. Steve, Steve Silverman, you got to include that in the lexicon. There you go. Um, another old friend. Dale Parfit, W4OP. I talked about this earlier. He mentioned I mentioned the 2Q from 1967. He said, wow, I hadn't seen that, but it's so cool. He, he agreed. We've been hearing from Nick the Vic, M0NTV, over there in the UK. He has really been taken with glow sticks, PTOs, DC receivers, and I mentioned his AM breakthrough testing. So one thing I really like about Nick is, you know, he's a good example of a of a, of a relative newcomer to ham radio but who has really gotten into and become quite proficient at home brewing. He's one. Another one is Dean, KK4DAS. These guys have only been in the hobby a few years, but they're building the same kind of stuff that we build, Pete, and it's it's really Im impressive, and it's great. It's encouraging, too. I think it's encouraging for newcomers to realize that you don't have to spend 30, 40, or 50 years to be able to build an SSB transceiver. These guys are building it after two, three, four years, so... Anyway, hats off to, to, to both of them. And, and Nick, great, great videos you're putting out. We, um, oh, I, I already mentioned Todd, our friend out in Portland with uh, mostly DIY RF, but he, he also sent in some suggestions for what he thought would be cool, you know, youthful names for the direct conversion receiver that we're building. I don't know if you saw this, Pete, but one of the names he suggested was because of the, the kind of oscillator that we're using, Maybe we should call it the PT Cruiser. Oh. Now, I, I kind of like it. Yes. But I'm not 18 years old. So one thing I've learned from my kids is that stuff that I think is really cool and interesting, they look at me and they say, ugh, ugh. So I think we'll have to leave it to the to the students to figure out what they want to call these things. Wasn't PT-109 one of the he, others? He also mentioned PT-109, which is, of course, John F. Kennedy's uh, ship during the war. But he also mentioned PT-73. I, and he claims that I think that was from McHale's Navy. Of Navy, yes. Who knew? PT-73, there's a connection with ham radio, there right? There um, We heard from a, a fellow named Levi, who is um, who got a Globe VFO, similar to the one I, I, got, I have here that I had as a novice, the Globe VFO Deluxe. With an deluxe. E. With an E. With, a, with an E at the end, de yes. Deluxe. Makes, makes it even more <laughs> Deluxe. Um and he has followed my lead, and I, I forgot that I did this, but he is now replacing the selenium diodes in the Globe VTO. I told him, be careful, man. <laughs> don't blow yourself up. And don't don't release any of the toxic smoke from the selenium rectifiers. They're quite stinky <coughs> when they go bad. Yeah, I know. 
Um, but he's going to replace them. But but I, I sent him a message. I said, I am not alone. I thought I was the only one in the world doing this. Here's somebody he's, else doing he's, this. He's going to get hate mail for, for removing the selenium rectifier. He will I get know, hate yes. mail. Yes, I, I got some of that same hate mail, like that yes. I was disturbing the, the pristine natural state and there's nothing wrong with selenium. He's being he's being anti-selenium. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> all right. Um, got an email from from Spain, uh, Juanjo, EC five ACA, and he he is interested in the DC receiver. I hope he builds one. Go for it, Juanjo. Very good. Good to hear from you. Um, we got an email from a guy. I put this up on the blog, Dave. I don't think he has a call sign, but he was intrigued by the idea, and I mentioned this on one of our one of the uh, the YouTube videos of building a kind of a discrete version of the LM three eighty six. The LM386 um, IC chip, the audio amplifier. So Jenny List over at Hackaday, who's a ham and a great friend of ours, picked up on this. And I think Jane, Jenny was just being a little bit creative in the title because the title was a homebrew 386. Now, those of us who've been in the computer world for a while know that homebrew 386 conjures up the idea computer. of a 386 PCU, central yeah. processing unit, right? Yeah. CPU. But that's not what she was talking about. She was talking about not a <clears throat> CPU 386, but an LM 386. Well, if you look at the comments on Jenny's post, this provoked all kinds of harsh accusatory. Why didn't you make it clear that it was an audio amplifier? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, man. Take a take a chill pill, dudes. I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> click again if you don't like it. Just go like this. Click and then you don't like it. Okay, fine. Okay, good. But anyway, it's an interesting project. Dave has it up there, and I put links to uh, Dave's schematic and the net list for his uh, his project up on the blog. Thanks to Jenny for including that. Hey, George Zaff, the guy who runs Ham Radio Workbench, and somebody had referred to Ham Radio Workbench as a spiritual brother of the Solder Smoke oh, podcast. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote to George saying I agree completely, but um, but really great. Good to hear from George. Uh, Alan, F4IET, he's still working on his DC receiver. And man, last time I felt bad in the last podcast, I got his call sign wrong. But the correct call sign is Foxtrot 4, India, Echo, Tango, Alan, over there in France, building DC receivers. Great stuff. Um, Drew, N7DA, is, is building Pixie receivers using 3D printed forms for the box and various parts inside. I don't know, you know, the Pixies, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I always have my doubts about it. I think you do too, Pete. You know, Einstein said, keep it simple, but not too simple. I think the Pixies might be a bit too simple. Well, you know, my bent on the Pixies is uh, many new hams buy one of those and uh, they play with it for about a month, make no contacts and give up in the, on the hobby. I mean, you can make contacts with it, but typically the, they're sold on 7.123 or something like that. Not, not not many stations are in that active part of the band, and you just get kind of frustrated. So, yeah. uh, I, I mean, if you're a seasoned guy and you, you want a toy, that's kind of cool. But if you're just starting out, that's not probably not the rig of choice. And, yeah, I mean, that, that that's right. A lot of guys will say, hey, uh, this thing's so simple. Why don't you propose it for, <clears> for, uh, for, for beginners, especially kind of regen receivers? And I'm thinking, wow, man, I, I built a regen receiver with just one active device, with one uh, FET. It's, it's simple, but it's so simple that you really have to be quite experienced and skillful to make a contact with it. So yes. in, in that regard, I think it's it's too simple. But anyway, good luck with that, Drew. I, we got an email from from Tony G six XMO in Sheffield, and he's getting a he's in retirement now, but he's getting a a a, a 3D printing business going. And I, I this has really appealed to me because I don't have a 3D printer, and I usually have to lean on either Pete or uh, or Dean to print out this stuff for me. Mostly Dean lately because he's close by, but um. Uh, uh, Tony has set up a business that will do this for you, and I have the link up on the uh, on the solder smoke blog it's um whiz 3d parts.com.co.uk but the link will be up on on the blog also um chuck ke5 hpw wrote to us about restoring an old sw54 <coughs> i see that i knew he was going to respond that way yeah it's almost like pete let me i'll say something else and see if you get the same reaction um s38e <coughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Enough said. Pete is skeptical. Good luck with that, Chuck. Um, 
we we got some sticker news. We saw I spotted over on on Twitter, Colin, our old friend M one B U U, a mountain topper from from the UK, from Northern England, and he has a new rig and he has the sticker on it, the the great sticker that Jesse developed that says when you know stuff you can do stuff. It's it's been appearing all over the world, all over the world, everywhere. Um, and he put one on the rig and he put it up there and I sent it over to Lex in Luxembourg and Jesse, and they were both quite pleased. It's beautiful. So yeah, we need, we need more stickers. We need, I think we need some kind of improved stickers to get us a little bit about it away from the IBEW thing. Cause I don't want to get in trouble with the union. You know, that could be quite painful, Pete. Oh yes. Uh, don't want to mess with them. All right. Uh, good news here. Jim KI4 THZ. Jim Olds, he's in Arlington, Virginia, right down the road from me. And he is a distinguished professor of neuroscience. And I have I have contacted him over the years for advice about the neuroscience profession. My son is in this area and he's always been really, really helpful. And he is now a home brewer. And I, at my suggestion, he has joined Vienna Wireless Society. He's on the faculty at George Mason University. Wow. And they recently put a home brew radio astronomy receiver up on the roof of one of the George Mason University buildings. Homebrew for the, I think they're looking at the hydrogen line. Wow. Radio astronomy. I mean, we got to get into this, but it's really great to have him on board with Vienna Wireless. Uh, I mentioned Tony G4WIF. He, he, um, he mentioned, he talked about the mechanical counter and I told him I have some in the junk box. Always great to hear from Tony. Listen, another old friend, Jonathan San. W0XO. I started talking to Jonathan when he was a, an English teacher in Japan many years ago. That's why I still call him Jonathan-san. But he and his wife and his son and daughter came to visit me one day when I was working at the State Department. We had a great lunch there. It was terrific. He brought in, we, I think we had like a show and tell there right in the State Department cafeteria. And uh, so it's good to hear from him again. And he has become a Patreon sponsor, a Patreon wow. sponsor. So I'm going to say, I'm going to use my limited, very, very limited Japanese. Origato, origato, Jonathan-san. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, K4SWL. He has the great uh, shortwave listening post video um, um, uh, blog. And he also has a, a QRP blog. But great stuff from Thomas. And I sent him the video of the tiny essay watching Vatican Radio sign off for the day. He got a kick about uh, that one and shared it with uh, his, his, his readers. Um, I sent around, I spotted something, and I, I spot some of the stuff sometimes on, on Facebook, and there was a guy who posted something about a Heathkit digital rig from 1978. Ooh, Heathkit tried yes. to build a digital rig, the SS8000. You knew about You knew about this, Pete, yes. right? Yes. And and I, I posted, I had never heard of this, but Chuck knew about it. Chuck included this pretty, pretty extensive discussion in his Heathkit book, but Farhan chimed in, and he knew about it, too, and and... It was just just great talking to these guys and connecting with with old friends. Uh, Ed KC8 SBV, another old friend, is working on DC receivers. You know, Ed is the peppermint bark box guy, and Ooh, I think yeah. I, I think you guys Christmas might even, is coming. Look 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 over there. You see that? I think it's is it right there. Yeah, yeah, you can see it right there. It is. I think. Hold on. Let me move myself away over here. I gotta see it. It's 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 right there. There's the peppermint bark box, and he sent me one. Last year, and I, I kept the box, and I've been using it to test DC receivers. And Ed continues to work on DC receivers and shares with us the results of his experimentation. So great to hear from you. Another old buddy, Bob, KD4EBM, who's here in the Northern Virginia area, he shared a video on the kind of the ultimate linear receiver, the R390. Yes. It, where when you turn that dial all kinds of gears and cams and, 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 and mechanisms, me mechanisms is the word, are moving all of the tuned circuits and all of the oscillators in the same direction. And I looked at that and I said, you know, we often implore people to homebrew their gear, but man, I, I just could not homebrew an R390. Yeah, that'd be tough. You, you'd have to have, you'd have to be a really good machinist with a really good machine shop. I wonder, has anyone done it? There's a question. There's a question for the group. You know who might know? Grayson. Grayson might know. 
I hope Grayson, because Grayson, Grayson has got a lot of experience with R390s. Yeah, he might know he, somebody. I think done he that. was actually talking about putting a like a small crane in his in his workshop yeah. so he could he could lift the things and move them around. No kidding around. It's yeah. like these little cranes that they use. You see them on the car shows when they're lifting the motor out of the car. You can get a, a crane like that from um, from some of the online suppliers. And I think Grayson wants to use those just just to move the R390s around because they're some heavy beasts. But uh, okay, has anybody built uh, home brewed an R390? Hey, listen, I got a question. We talked about this. This we, about the uh, the coherer. And Pete pointed out that it might have been from from France. But there's a guy in in our radio club, George, who is a really very proficient technical ham. But he has gotten interested in how uh, Marconi did his original transatlantic test with the coherer and the coherer as the detector. And the thing is, given the very, very, very minute amount of RF coming in transatlantic, was there enough RF to cause those little pieces of metal in the coherer to group together and increase the conductivity or, or not? I mean, there's always been a lot of speculation about whether the Marconi actually got transatlantic when he said he did. Um, but George has been looking at it and trying to figure out if Marconi could get that coherer to work the way he said it did in the transatlantic test. So if anybody uh, has any more info about that, please send it my way and I'll share it with George. Finally, we got a, a uh, great email. Before you from, leave that, yeah. I, I had a question. How did they synchronize the tapper to reset the filings? How did they well, do that? Well, you know, there, there's a video and it's from the guy who does who did the Secret Life of Machines videos. Tim oh, yeah, Huskins, Tim Huckins. Yeah. Yeah. And he did he re recently remastered the Secret Life of Radio. And it was great because they took his his partner went out on the pier, I think at Bournemouth, and set up out on the pier a transmitter using the spark gap from the car. Yeah. And and then uh he set up, I think it was Tim, Tim set up on the shoreline a receiver using a homebrewed coherer and there was a little tap that that just periodically tapped it tap, 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 tap. so it was constantly tapping it tap and tap 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 when the guy out on the dock put key down you would you would hear the tone coming through the coherer was working so that was the only time i've actually seen a demonstration of one of these things working and it, it worked in the demonstration but I don't know if it would work transatlantic. This was just line yeah. of sight out to the pier. And, and low frequency. Low, low, low frequency. So um, George is investigating Marconi's coherer. And did it actually cohere? Did it work? Yeah, it worked. Bye -bye, man. Bye -bye, man. <laughs> okay, look, uh, but we got an email from Steve, Echo India 5, Delta, Delta. He sends us the Connaught Radio News. This is the newsletter that we were all kind of ooing and eyeing about all of us were jealous because it's so good. It's got, a, it's a kind of a collection of news from various different Irish radio clubs. And it's a reminder of the experimental nature of ham radio in Ireland. Really great stuff. Pete, I was happy to see, you'll see it when I, when I send it, but all through this thing, he has your sticker, the sticker with your quote that Jesse made up, the sticker she appears in there all through it and all kinds of uh, links to the solder smoke blog and the whole solder smoke community so thanks for doing that steve and thanks for sending us the connaught radio news pete we've been going on here this is great this is like the old days we got on an hour and 38 minutes good stuff hey listen i don't think we're going to be able to do another podcast before christmas right so let's say happy holidays merry christmas happy new year to everybody right absolutely and go to the solder smoke blog Look up in the upper right hand corner. <laughs> oh yes, that's right. When you're, when you're doing your Christmas giving, Shut don't forget about solder smoke. Send so, us. Yes. Have no. Don't you don't send us money. Have Bezos send us some yes. money for Th Christmas. This is where you need to do your shopping. <laughs> please, please. Bill's going to the four S's and he needs some help. I need some money down there. It's expensive. Nope. Yeah. Hey Pete, good luck to you. I know you got some, you have a tough time ahead. Yes. And uh, we wish you the best. Thank you. And. Um, and I hope things things settle down and, and and get better for you. I really do. And and we all think about you a lot. So uh, let's say let's say seven three from Northern Virginia. Thanks everybody. Seven threes from the left coast. Ciao, Pete. Ciao.